Good evening. Welcome to Bible study at Fullview Missionary Baptist Church. I hope you've had a wonderful week so far. Hope that you were able to stay safe today from all the stormy weather that continues to be in our area. Join me in a moment of prayer, please. Dear God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you and a God, a God the Father on our behalf, and he is our advocate. And as we look at what Paul talks about tonight, he's our big brother. If you've never had a big brother, it's a wonderful thing to have a big brother. Big brothers block and tackle for little brothers. And Jesus is our big brother. And so as we look at the book of Romans, let's keep our eye on the prize. And remember, it's not just on us. We couldn't save ourselves, but God could. And so I told my friend, I said, you know where you're going. You're going to heaven through the sacrifice of Jesus. And we're not just alone. There's a third part of the God uh, trinity that we haven't talked about. The spirit helps us in our weaknesses. The spirit prays for us and helps protect us. And it's up to us to ask the spirit to come to us and help us and to help keep us safe. You know, it's springtime, y'all. And if my wife was here, she'd tell you, I like baseball. I'm one of those rare people that, you know, baseball's had problems with attendance and dwindling interest and things like that, but I like baseball. And in the 70s and 80s, the man you see at the plate there dominated a lot of baseball. That's Ricky Henderson at the plate. And you notice how intently he is looking at the picture, at the pitcher. And he is ready for that pitcher to release that ball. And when he releases it, he'll keep his eye on that ball. Because Ricky Henderson's goal was to just get on base. And we as Christians, we need to keep our eye on the prize. Keep our eye on the goal. And right now, we need to stay focused on what God has given for us. And what it means to each and every one of us. As always, when we discuss scripture, it's wonderful to know the who, what, when, where, how, and why. As we examine this book of Romans tonight, from Romans 8, we're going to ask ourselves, who wrote this book? It was Paul. Why did he write it? Who did he write it to? We're going to begin to get into that. We were talking a little bit earlier, the technical crew and I, and we were talking about how all of these things happened. And we look at these travels that Paul and all his friends made during this time. They went all over the known world. The map you have in front of you is color coded by time frame showing the Roman Empire as it expanded. You know, many of us today, when we get out on the big roads and, and we drive around and we get on the interstate highways, we take those things for granted. But until Rome came along, most of these areas didn't have roads that were cut across the mountainside and through the swamps and valleys and had bridges that people could cross over rivers. But Rome put those in. And Paul and his uh, traveling companions and other people spreading the good news about Jesus' sacrifice and life after death used those roads to spread God's word. The Roman Empire early on was an enemy of the church, but it also was a big enabler of the church. So as we dig into this a little bit deeper, let's talk a little bit about it. We know a little bit about Paul. He had a Roman name, Paul, but he was a Jew who descended from a father who was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. So he also had a Jewish name, Saul. Any of us go by two names sometimes around the house? Sometimes we call it a nickname. Sometimes it's a little more formal. In Paul's case, it was this whole language thing, and who's this audience? We know that Paul was a Jew's Jew, as he called himself. He was a Pharisee born from Pharisees. His father was from the tribe of Benjamin. He went to university in Jerusalem after growing up in Tarsus, in, up in Asia Minor, which would today be modern-day Turkey. Uh, we know that Paul... Uh, early on opposed the church 
He didn't throw any stones, but she sure helped enable it. He held the coats of the men that sacrificed the first person killed because they believed in Jesus, and that was the deacon Stephen. And we re must remember that the term deacon actually is a preacher. It's not just a lay person. It's a very spiritual role in the church, the term deacon is. We know that when Paul was arrested at, at a certain point in his career, one of the Roman soldiers looked at him and, and Paul said, hey, uh, can I talk to you, man? And the soldier said to him, what are you doing talking in Greek? I thought you were that guy from Egypt. And Paul said, no, I'm not from Egypt at all. I'm from Tarsus and I'm actually a Roman citizen. And the Roman soldier got a little afraid because they'd already beat Paul. And you weren't supposed to do certain things to Roman citizens. We think sometimes today we have trouble with rights and privileges of uh, law-abiding citizens. These things are new, and we know that Paul was a person of color, because otherwise, would they, why would they have mistaken him for an Egyptian? So Paul then turned to the crowd. He said, can I talk to the crowd? And the soldier gave him permission. He turned to the crowd and spoke to them in their language, which at the time was Aramaic. So this man was fluent in Greek, the official language of Rome. He also knew Aramaic. He knew all the Old Testament scriptures. And he would be writing many, if not most, of the New Testament scriptures eventually. So we've talked about some of the players. We won't spend too much time on that tonight. That's a little less important to this story because this letter is written more so to be written to the church at Rome. And we're going to get right into that in a moment. So again, here we look at Paul's journeys and why this map is important on his third missionary journey as he has gone back to Corinth for the third time. It was a troubled congregation in a troubled part of the uh, Macedonian uh, Peninsula, which is today called Greek, Greece. And when Paul gets there, he writes this letter to the church at Rome. So as we look at this epistolary literature, we know that when Paul wrote these type letters, it, it ended up uh, being a great deal of the ones that we enjoy today. We placed them in the New Testament canon according to their size quite often and how they were used in the church and based on that history justification. So Romans is the first Pauline epistle after the book of Acts. We've got the non-Pauline ones and some of these are disputed. As we look at these books, some theologians think they were all written by Paul other than the ones that are specifically not written by Paul, like 1st, 2nd, 3rd Peter, I'm sorry, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, things like that, the book of James. We know those were written by other people. Some of the ones that were written by Paul, it was like, was this Paul? Was it a scribe uh, working as Paul's secretary? Was it an editor who wrote like Paul? We know that there are authors today that write books in modern times, and all of those books aren't written by those authors. All the books that James Patterson put out, I don't have the proof, but do you really think he's writing all of those books in those series? Probably not. But was Paul writing all these books? We don't know for sure, but what we do know is how it feeds into us and helps us today as we try to learn how to live our lives. Well, one of the things we have to do when we're looking at scripture again is to slow down and get a thickened version of it. By thickening, what is the historical context of what's going on in the scripture? As we look at these books, we need to understand what's going on with these people that these scriptures were written to, or even in the place where the writer was writing from. Because where we are always affects how we feel, how we think, what we say, what we do, and certainly what we write. So we look here at the world behind the text and look at historical criticism. So let's start thinking a little bit about this world behind the text. I apologize for the washed out look of this, but this is Paul's resume. He started his career as a Christian, a believer in Christ, around 33 in the common area around, you know, a little less than 30 years after the death of Christ because we understand that some of the early calendars were incorrect and Christ was actually uh, 
crucified around six years into the common area. So around 27 years into the common area, Paul is converted on the road to Damascus. We look further down the page here, and we see some 30 plus years later, Paul writes the book of Romans in around 57 AD, or 57 into years into the common area. So as Paul is writing his book to the Romans, What's going on in the Roman church that the great apostle Paul thinks he needs to write these folks a letter? Well, let's take a look at this book of Romans and what Paul is doing. As you can see, let's go back for a moment to his uh, resume. This man had a powerful career. He worked from 33 uh, A.D. all the way up through the early 60s. He had went on three missionary journeys. He wrote books to the people at Thessalonica and uh, Ephesus. He wrote First and Second Timothy. Some of that's disputed, but we believe he wrote both of those. He wrote to Titus, another pastor who needed guidance. He wrote First and Second Corinthians and the book of Galatians. So this man's curriculum vitae or his resume, because if Paul was working today, he'd be a college professor. And that's what he does in the book of Romans. He writes to the church of Romans to at Roman at Rome to instruct them. And also he makes many arguments about how they should and should not live and how they should and should not believe. And he gives them evidence as he makes his arguments, just like a college professor would do if you were in a lecture class and they were teaching logic and showing you an argument and backing it up with evidence. We look at this Alpine mountain range in the Alps in Europe. In the background, we see huge mountains. Here in uh, the foreground, right at the beginning of the picture, we see a smaller mountain. Down in the valley, we can't see, but there are villages there. The Book of Rome, Romans, is Paul's alpine peak. It towers above everything else he wrote. Any theologian that has studied anything about the New Testament and Pauline writings knows that this is the best that he ever did. It is a huge piece of literature and it is not simple language. Paul wrote in complex sentences and we have to take our time and look at those sentences as we go through. And that's some of what we're going to do tonight. So again, if we look at some of the things that Paul did in the first eight chapters of the book of Romans, because he really wrote this first eight chapters, one through eight, as an introduction to an introduction. And so basically what's going on here is, is in the first chapter he says to us, faith is the beginning and the end. He goes on and says, man's moral nature testifies to God. Then he talks to us about Plead nothing to God but Jesus' blood. Because again, all we need to focus on is the fact that this world is not our home. And though we're here to do many wonderful things, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. And our goal is eternal life through the sacrifice that Jesus made and being redeemed of the sins that all men do. So we have to keep our eyes on that. As Paul wrote this introduction in chapter 4, he talked about a timeless truth. He talked about what a trustworthy God we have. Too often, we have this view of God as only being this punitive God, of only not being loving to us. And as we talked about last week, too many times, we have that view because we haven't had a nurturing relationship with our Father or maybe even our mother. I remember one time I was in college and I was broke, y'all. Didn't have anything to eat that day. Times were real lean. I didn't get to work the summer before because I had to go to summer school. I'd gotten a little behind in my training and I needed to graduate in four years or my scholarship was going to run out. My grant money was going to run out. So the prior summer, I didn't work. And I had very little savings. I, I mean, I'd run out of money. And didn't have anything to eat that day. And a friend of mine and I were standing outside the, uh, the cafeteria and outside the door. And he looked at me and he said, Fry ain't got no money, man. I said, man, I ain't got nothing either. He said, what you got in your room either? I said, man, I ain't got nothing. You ain't got no canned goods? I ain't got nothing. And we stood out there for about 30 minutes talking. And I looked in the distance across the big parking lot. 
and I could see a big, tall CB antenna. And I looked at my friend, I said, hey, dude, we're going to be all right. He said, man, how do you think we're going to be all right? I said, we're going to be all right. I said, because you see that antenna coming there? I said, that's Jim Fry's antenna. And I know if my dad is coming to see me, we might not have much, but whatever he's got, I can get some of it. My daddy showed up and gave me two pounds of ground beef, uh, a, a, a T-bone steak that was so thick it looked more like a roast, and he gave me a $20 bill. And it was like he handed me a million dollars because it kept me focused on why I was there in school. And it made me stop wanting to think about quitting. Folks, we got some tough times going on right now, but this is not time for us to quit. We've got to stay focused on keeping ourselves safe and remembering what it is that God has us here for and focusing on that purpose and loving everybody that we meet. In chapter 5, Paul said us, history's clearest thing that we need to remember is, is I love you. And I know God loves me. I grew up so poor that we could tell when the chickens was out by looking through the floor. And I look around at how we live, many of us today, and even though these are tough times, as the economic relief pours out this week, I heard today that almost $300 billion are coming out from the government to help about 85% of the uh, uh, citizens in the United States today. So we've got a lot to be thankful for. And we truly believe that as we continue to work our way through this pandemic, that God's love will continue to be shown not only by each of us showing each other, but by the blessings that continue to come to us. In chapter 6, we talked about what I hit on just a little bit earlier. We said that the new life after this life is our goal. And we can choose that life because Jesus has died for us. And Jesus has risen again. He has been sacrificed for our sins. The church at Rome was not started by one of the apostles. None of them had been there. Instead, it was started by lay people who had probably heard about Jesus at the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem when 3,000 souls were saved. And the Holy Spirit came on so strong that you could hear it like a rushing wind. And those folks had gone back to Rome in the middle of all that decadence. Let's look at the historical context of not only this epistle, but all of these epistles that Paul wrote. Most of these letters were written to people crowded into tightly packed cities. Many of these people were poor. Occasionally they were working class like an Aquila or Priscilla. Occasionally they were Lydia people like her who was a businesswoman and sold purple cloth. But most of these folks were working poor in a city and it was a struggle to get housing and to get food and even water. And certainly education was not something that they could afford. So these people were the working poor. Quite often they were minorities. Many of them were not Roman citizens like a Paul. And in this letter, in this church in Rome, it was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And most of them were not Roman citizens. So these were people at the bottom of the pyramid, meaning the wealthy at the top. And these were the working poor that Paul's writing to. It was not a good thing to come up with something new that didn't believe that Caesar was God. And it was already hard enough to be a Jew and Greek belief and Roman culture belief didn't believe in life after death. So to come in and start talking about living after dying on this earth and not worshiping Caesar as a God and talking about a man named Jesus who we would all follow and he would come back someday and reunite us together with him. That was something that Rome would be afraid of and not like. So if you look down at chapter 8, resurrection life is ours. God truly will make us like Jesus. And how will he do that? He'll do it through the help of the Holy Ghost, through the Holy Spirit. Paul calls it the Spirit in his book of Romans. And so as we get to look at that, we start taking a look a little bit deeper. Let's start looking at some of the scriptures here. In chapter 8, 
In the contemporary English version, it reads, if you belong to Christ Jesus, you won't be punished. The Holy Spirit will give you life that comes from Christ Jesus and will set you free from sin and death. The law of Moses cannot do this because our selfish desires make the law weak. But God set you free when he sent his own son to be like us sinners and to be a sacrifice for our sin. God used Christ's body to condemn sin. He did this so that we would do what the law commands by obeying the spirit instead of in our own desires. We have to remember, how does a Christian become saved? How do we ensure that we know the answer when we ask ourselves, I don't know where I'm going when I die? We know what we believe and we've covered it tonight. And it's just really that simple. Do we believe in Jesus? Do we believe he's the son of God that was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures? Do we believe that he was crucified on one day and three days later rose and eventually ascended into heaven? Do we understand that he's our big brother and through him we are heir to the blessing that Abraham was said in Genesis he would bless the whole world. That's what Paul was writing to this mixed congregation about. He wrote to the church at Rome. And in, you know, in, a, in, 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 a, in, that, in that language, Roma, uh, in the back, if you, if you did it in reverse, it means amor, love. So he wrote to a church that was in the middle of a city that was quite vicious quite often. The Roman Colosseum had not yet been built in this time frame, so Christians were not being sacrificed yet, but in the decades to come, that would begin to occur. For entertainment in the years ahead, Christians would be sacrificed by being fed to wild beasts or tied to the back of a wild bull or boar or something else and martyred because of their beliefs. As we look at this again, the Old Testament had taught the people that were Jewish in this congregation that in order to produce righteousness of God, they had to follow the law of Moses. That sounds great, but it's really hard to follow the law of anything. You know, I was driving around today and before I knew it, I was speeding a little bit. I saw the police before he was able to uh, clock me, and I slowed down just in time. But sometimes without thinking, we break the law. Sometimes with thinking, we break the law. As my wife will remind me sometimes, hey, Speedy Gonzalez, you need to slow down. People who are ruled in verse 5, it says, are ruled by their desires, think only of themselves. Everyone who is ruled by the Holy Spirit thinks about spiritual things. If our minds are ruled by our desires, we will die. But if our minds are ruled by the Spirit, we will have life and peace. Our desires fight against God because they do not and cannot obey God's laws. If we follow our desires, we cannot please God. We keep from following our, God, our desires by focusing on God and wanting to please God and we ask the Holy Spirit to come on our behalf and help us stay focused on what we're trying to achieve. We're not trying to just achieve this world. This is not our home. This is not our goal. Like Ricky Henderson at the plate in the 70s and 80s when the uh, Oakland Athletics dominated baseball off and on for, for those two decades. All his job was to do was to get on base. If Ricky got on base and somebody bonded the ball afterwards, before you know it, he'd be on third base. If somebody hit a sacrifice fly from there, he would score. He was the leadoff hitter. And to most of the people that we know in our houses, in our families, on our jobs, in our communities, people look up to us. And we are the lead off hitter. And we have to keep our eyes on the prize. There's so many things in this world that's easy for us to want to do. There's certain things that we just can't do. There's certain places as people of God, we, we just ought not go. And I'll leave that between you and God to get into that. There are certain practices that we just shouldn't do. There are certain TV shows that we just ought not watch. 
And we have to ask the Holy Spirit to come to us and inspire us not to do that. Verse 9 says, you're no longer ruled by your desires, but by God's spirit who lives in you. People who don't have the spirit of Christ in them don't belong to him. But Christ lives in you. So you are alive because God has accepted you, even though your bodies must die because of your sin. Yet God raised Jesus to life. God's spirit now lives in you, and he will raise you to life by the spirit. Paul in these sentences, he makes this argument to the people at Rome. He said, you're not, you're not you know, I know you're living in Rome. I know you hadn't ever seen an apostle, but someday as he writes later in this book, he tells them, I'm going to come and visit you. He didn't know he'd be coming as a prisoner. And even as he got there as a prisoner, he continued to tell people about Jesus. Everywhere we go, folks, we need to tell people about Jesus. And the way we really need to do it is by how people look at us, how we talk to folks, how we treat people, the things we do and don't do. The way we handle ourselves, the places we go. Uh, I remember one time I was uh, worshiping at another church and the pastor was a nationally known preacher. And uh, my wife and I moved. So when we moved, we moved to a different congregation because it was too far for us to commute back to that church. And we went on a church trip to Washington, D.C. And actually there we actually no, we were in New York City driving down Park Avenue and there was that pastor walking down Park Avenue with his wife and at some point a few months later after I returned to Memphis we saw that preacher and I told him I was in New York a few months ago and I, I couldn't get your attention because we were on a big bus but we saw you walking down Park Avenue and the first thing he said to me was well I'm so glad I was with my wife and we had a good laugh about it but there are certain things, folks, that we just, the people of God, we can't do. So, verse 10 says, but Christ lives in us. So you are alive because Christ has accepted you. Even though your bodies must die because of your sins, yet God raised Jesus to life. God's spirit now lives in you, and he will raise you to life by his spirit. That's our goal, folks. Yeah, one day on this world, every man or woman that was born to live will also die. But yet, we will live again. These were new concepts to a church formed in Rome on the Italian peninsula following Greek and Roman beliefs that didn't believe in life after death. Paul wrote to them in verse 12, he said, My dear friends, we must not live to satisfy our desires. If you do, you will die. But you will live if by the help of God's spirit you say no to your desires. Only those people who are led by God's spirit are his children. God's spirit doesn't make us slaves who are afraid of him. Instead, we became his children and call him father. I'm Jim Fry's boy. I got five big brothers. I got five big brothers. And I can still pick up the phone and call four of them. One of them has preceded me in death. We were Jim Fry's boys, and we were his boys because we acted like certain things he told us you do and don't do. Jim Fryer always told me, I don't care what a woman says or does, does or doesn't do, you don't put a hand, your hands on in anger. You didn't do that in our house. You don't cuss your woman. You're not abusive. And if you have your children, you should marry. Those are the things Jim Fryer told us. I've tried to live my life like that, and I don't condemn anybody that doesn't, but those are the things that I try to show people as a man that we ought to be doing. I see too many men today that don't get the blessing that having a child meet you at the door when you can return from wherever it is you've been provides for you. The most joyous thing you get is somebody that was harvested from you, that looks like you, may have feet like your mama, may walk like your daddy, may look like your wife one day and the next day look like you 
And when you come home, all of that energy comes to you just to say, hey, daddy. Hey, mama. I'm so glad to see you. Where you been? Why I take you so long to come back to me? Jesus reminds us in this book that Paul wrote to us, we're just dear friends of God. We must not live to satisfy our desires that we may have because if we do, we're going to die. And we're not only going to die on this earth, we'll die permanently. But if we want to live in the next life, we have to say no to our desires and we have to do the things that we know to be right. In verse 15 it says, God's spirit doesn't make us slaves who are afraid of him. Instead, we become his children and call him father. One of the TV shows my wife and I do watch, we watch NCIS, Naval Criminal Investigative Services. And uh, there was this uh, character on there named, uh, 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 what was that woman's name? Ziva David. We would say Ziva David. And a few years into the show, her father was killed on the show. And she screamed, Abba! And I felt a chill go through my spine because I knew she was calling out Father. And we need to call out sometimes to God because he's our Father. I wasn't afraid of Jim Fryer. I, 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 I respected him. But I wasn't afraid of him. I did my best to follow his rules. I did my best to try to live my life the way he had taught me to live it. I did the same with my mom. And as we look at this analogy here, we are who we come from. And we come not only from the people on this earth that God has placed to deliver us to this place and time and train us and gift us and get us ready to do the things we're here to do, but we also are here because we are children of God. In verse 17 it says his spirit lets us know that together with Christ we will be given what God has promised. We will also share in the glory of Christ because we have suffered with him. I am sure, verse 18 says, that what we are suffering now cannot compare with the glory that will be shown to us. I saw Ricky Henderson get hit with baseballs. I saw people throw at his head. I saw people do everything they could to do to help him lose focus that his only job as the leadoff hitter was to get on base. Because high percentage of the time, if Ricky Henderson got on base, he was going to score. And folks, our job now is to remember why God put us here. In verse 19 it says, in fact, all creation is eagerly waiting for God to show who his children are. Well, guess what? He's already shown us. Many of us under my voice come from people who were enslaved. I talked about the poverty that many of us grew up in earlier. I talked about how I had relatives who could look through the wall and say hello to you walking down the street. And I remember when the chickens would get out, we would know they were out because we could see them through the floor. And now when we look at how we're living, even those of us that are struggling under a famine right now. I remember when we showed you earlier Paul's curriculum vitae, his resume earlier. I retired last year and I looked back across my career when I pulled up my 401k statement. I saw the lean years, and the first year I worked with a job that took out Social Security, I made $237. $237 was what I made that year. I saw the years when I got raises, sometimes 10%, sometimes 20%. I remember one year my salary doubled. I saw the lean years when the famine hit my household. In modern times, we call that a corporate downsizing. I was laid off and no income came in for two years. And yet, like the scripture said, I never saw the children of the righteous beg bread. And I couldn't say I was totally righteous, but we didn't beg bread. And nobody came and took anything. And everything we owned, we even acquired some things while I was off work. God has been so faithful to us, people. 
All he asks us to do is to remember why he placed us here. And that is to have faith in the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. To remember that we have been redeemed of the sins that we make by commission and omission. By the things we think and the things we do. Verse 23 reminds us, well, let's go back to 22. We know that all creation is still groaning and is in pain like a woman about to give birth. I've never given birth. I watched my wife go through it twice. And I think most of us men would jokingly but seriously admit that if men had to give birth, we would go extinct in just part of one generation. It's painful a lot of times living this life. It's difficult, like these people in these cities that Paul wrote to. We quite often feel so poorly prepared for the things that we have to deal with every day. Making a living, taking care of our children, responsibilities on the job, oppressive seeming governments, unfair seeming governments. Things done to you that are appearing to be totally illegal. The same thing that these Roman Christians were dealing with, does that not sound familiar at what we struggle with today? But God still advises us to follow the laws of our land, to pay taxes when we're supposed to pay taxes, to give unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar, but give unto God our hearts, because that's what our purpose is. Our purpose is to be the children of God that we've been called to be. The spirit in verse 23 says, makes us sure about what we will be in the future. But now we groan silently while we wait for God to show that we are his children. This means that our bodies will also be set free. And this hope is what saves us. But if we already are what we hope for, there's no need to keep on hoping. However, we hope for something we have not yet seen, and we patiently wait for it. I want to make sure that we take some time here, and let's talk about God's love. Paul wrote to this church, and these are all of these scriptures are sound bites. So many of these scriptures we're looking at tonight, you hear them all the time. Famous composers take these scriptures and put them in verses and songs. Johann Sebastian Bach put them in his works. Uh, other authors use them in theirs. These are the types of things that you'll hear in sermons quite often. And here's this part of this chapter 8 that wasn't what we were going to study. But it spoke to me so strong that I knew we needed to hear this tonight. The Holy Spirit shared that with me. In verse 31, it says, what can we say about all this? If God is on our side, can anyone be against us? God did not keep back his own son, but he gave him for us. If God did this, won't he freely give us everything else? If God says his chosen ones are acceptable, then no indeed. Can anyone bring charges against them? Or can anyone condemn them? No indeed. Christ died and has raised to life. And now he's at God's right side speaking to him. And here's the part that really begins to get me excited. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, suffering, and hard times, a hunger, and nakedness, and danger, and death? It is exactly as the scriptures say. For we face death all day long. We are like sheep on their way to be butchered. In everything we have won more than a victory because of Christ who loves us. I am sure that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not life or death, not angels or spirits, not the present or the future, not powers above or powers below. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Of God for us in Christ Jesus. So often people will be quick to say, oh, I know they're dying and going to hell, but that's not what Paul wrote. I don't care what demons in our life, I don't care what actions we do or place, I don't care how we die. I remember I went to 
the funeral of a great man one time. And unfortunately, he got so depressed, he took his own life. And the pastor, when he preached his sermon, he pointed out to us that even suicide, as hideous as that is, and, and, and in these times, we need to check in on each other. If there are people that are going through trouble and things, when was the last time we picked up the phone and called them to check on them? When was the last time we checked in to make sure they're okay? When was the last time we did a mental health check on all others and even ourselves in these difficult times? Can hard times and suffering and trouble or hunger or nakedness or danger or death? I talked to someone recently whose mother died when she was one year old and she has no recollection of her. Can even that separate us from the love of God? Not growing up knowing the love of a mother? I don't think so. And I know so because that's not what Paul wrote, because that's not what the Holy Spirit told him to write, and that's not what the God that we know says to each and every one of us. So as we look at this book, Paul encouraged us to continue to take certain steps. He said in Galatians 6 and 9, right after he told us to be careful about whatsoever we sow it, for that shall also we reap, he wrote, for I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. We know things are tough right now, but we know things are going to be all right. We know things are really challenging in this world today. There's death ever present with us. People are still getting infected at the rate of between 65 and 70,000. We're still in our country alone having 2,000 to 3,000 deaths a day from the COVID pandemic. But Paul reminds us in 18 uh, verse of the Romans, as we've looked at earlier, the journey has been long and arduous. But we are confident that God has brought us this far, has not brought us this far to leave us. You could have never told my father's grandfather, who was enslaved in the sweltering heat of the uh, Delta of Mississippi, clearing land to grow someone else's cotton, knowing that his children would be enslaved and thinking incorrectly that his children's children would be enslaved. But that wasn't the case because my grandfather was born in Reconstruction after slavery, even though some of his older siblings were born during slavery. My father grew up in the backdrop of that. You could have never told him when he was young that his children would be able to live the lives that we're now blessed to live. And we have to remember that the journey has been tough. But Jesus has made a way for us. He's made the sacrifice to do what we couldn't do we couldn't follow the law of the Old Testament just like the Jews couldn't. And someone had to be sacrificed and animal sacrifice was not enough for the sacrifice to clear the sin of mankind. That's what prize we have to keep ourselves focused on. We have to remember our goal. In 1987, the Cleveland Browns were five yards from scoring a touchdown. And they handed the ball off to their workhorse running back. He had almost 200 yards that day. Just under 100 running the ball and a little over 100 catching the ball and running. I have no criticism for the running back, but someone grabbed that ball and ripped it out of his hands. And he fumbled that ball, and Cleveland hasn't gotten that close to winning an American Football Conference championship since then. Church, we have to remember what we're here for. You know what God placed you on this earth to do. It's time for us to focus on it. It's time for us to spend some time alone with our big brother Jesus and ask him to bring the Holy Spirit closer in contact in our lives. It's time for us to remember what Paul wrote about today. The journey has been tough, and we do have a lot more to do. There's work left to be done that you and I can do together up and down the byways and the streets and the places we go. As always, we continue to 
Help us focus on modern steps that we ought to do. Wear a mask. Practice social distancing. Wash your hands regularly. Sounds simple. We see people not wanting to do it all the time. And this is reckless behavior when we don't. Get a shot in your arm. My wife and I will be getting our second shot next week. The church is helping people get scheduled for shots. If you have problems getting scheduled for shots, get in touch with Pastor Williams. Leave a message at the church. There are volunteers willing and able to get on the websites, to help you make the calls, to help you find the directions, to help make sure that you can get a shot in your arm. And stay positive. Stay positive And stay calm. If God be with us, who can be against us and find ways that you can serve. Let's take a look at this benediction of sorts. A, a cousin of mine died uh, this past week uh, from thalassemia. It's a disease that's very similar to sickle cell anemia. And one of his sisters sent this to me as we converse back and forth about his death. As you step out today, may angels lead you May peace accompany you. May grace go before you. May love and light surround you. May kindness spread from you. May goodness and love follow you. May lessons teach you. May family support you. May friends encourage you. May God protect and bless you. And may your day be filled with love, peace, and joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next week, we're going to go back to the church at Ephesus. We're going to look at the book of Ephesus next week, the first chapter. Our lesson point next week will be take hold of all that God gives us in Jesus. And we're going to remember that there's only one body and one spirit, even as we're called in one hope of our calling, as we continue this month at full view to focus on what is our purpose of why God has placed us here. Uh, Brother Mandrill, will you come and pray for us as we leave this place, but never from God and never from each other? Right. As we uh, really enjoying our focus and living with our purpose, um, it's just um, very, very good to be able to uh, to continue to getting our teaching as we did before with uh, with Reverend Fryer and with Reverend Johnson. He came earlier last month. It is a very good thing, and we want to. Uh, to continue to be able to practically put the Lord's lessons in our life so we can, so he can manifest in our lives. And let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, thank you so much for just being, just having us here, whether we're at home, everyone out there, for those that, um, that are checking us out on our Bible study, God, thank you so much for giving us the gumption to come and to learn and to study so that we would show ourselves approved and to be able to inject this into our daily lives because that is what it is for. It is for the changing of lives. It's for us to live our lives before men so they would see something that they would want to become to be asking, what do I need to do to be saved? We are to be arrows pointing to Christ, God. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you for covering us. Thank you for keeping us healthy and strong, mentally, physically, and emotionally. And for those that are suffering from a deficiency in any of those areas, God, we ask you to go and to please go with them and sit with them and to increase them in those areas. And for those that are being pricked to do something that the Lord has them to do, God. We ask that you keep continuing to move in their lives and cover those that are that are working with people and our caretakers, people that are looking after people, all of those on the front lines, our healthcare workers, our industrial workers, our people in public works and things of like that that are providing, helping to provide the very basic needs that we need 
to be able to keep ourselves clean and to sanitize and to do everything that we need to do, God. We thank you so much. For those that are bereaved, God, or just going through something, God, please continue to sit with them and to just minister to them and to help us do the job of the church from that facet, Lord, and to sit with them and to minister to them and to help and to encourage and say something kind and do something kind. Let us get to moving, Lord, and doing the work and not be so carried away with church work, but doing the actual work of the church. We thank you for the opportunity, God, for those that are incarcerated, for those that are not able Thank you for supplementing and sitting with them, God. We know that you can and believe that you will. We thank you for the opportunity again, God, and help us to reconvene at the same time next week with the same vigor and the same excitement, ready to learn and ready to implant and put this in our lives so we can go and do your will. We ask in the matchless name of